Thank you all for being here. We're going to, I'm going to ask a few questions of Elizabeth and then we're going to open the floor to questions because we know that a lot of you people um, braved the snow to be out here today and um, uh, are very inquisitive and, and care deeply about the climate and the path that we're on. So we want to um, get as many questions to, from you to Elizabeth as we can. You know, you're so good at weaving the, the scientific facts along with the personal observations and the amazing travel that you've done to places um, that are on the front lines of what is happening on this planet and uh, talking to the scientists who are also kind of leading the charge and doing the work to help us explain where we're at. I wanted to ask though to, to take you back um, a bit on, on a personal level of, you, you now are a staff writer for The New Yorker, you're a fantastic author, um, but why did you begin to tackle this topic? of climate change? What drove you to it before a lot of others were writing about it? Well, it, it goes back to uh, when I really, I, I spent a lot of time working as a, as a daily journalist um, at the New York Times and I covered, I actually covered politics and I, I went to the New Yorker in 1999 and I was actually supposed to write a political column for the New Yorker um, and this was right at a time when the news cycle was really speeding up. And so it was really uh, getting harder and harder to write about politics that was moving so fast for a weekly. And I started to think about um, what should I be writing about, you know, that, that, that is, is, is the big issue that's going to be, you know, still going to be here a week from now, two weeks from now, a month from now. And uh, the issue that I found sort of most compelling and concerning not as a person who knew a lot about it, uh, au contraire, as a person who did not know a lot about it, uh, was climate change. And I sort of set out to write a story on climate change uh, that morphed into climate change in the Arctic, actually, where we were, people were seeing very clear signs of climate change already back in uh, the early 2000s. And that one story morphed into three, and by the time I was done with the three-part series, uh, I realized, as I think everyone, and there are many people in this room probably studying climate change, working on it, and anyone who kind of, you can't really dip your toe into climate change. It, it, it is such a huge issue. It turns out to be such an important issue that once you sort of start down that road, uh, you, you end up following it. Um, you can't feel like, well, I can't uh, just turn my back on, on this. So that, that's sort of what what happened to me. <laughs> Did you think in those early days that maybe it would just be a three-part series, though? <laughs> well, in the early topic? days, or honestly... did you anticipate yeah. where, where, where we're at and the, and the gravity of the situation? Right? No, I, I really, when I set out, I honestly, you know, it was still a time when you often read people, you know, debating climate change. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to know both for myself, for my kids, for the world, you know, what's the truth here? And um, I really didn't know it was possible to go and realize this was not such a big deal or we had lots and lots of decades to deal with it or whatever. And, you know, even then in the early 2000s when you talk to scientists, they were really actually quite unanimous uh, that this is big, it's coming at us very fast, uh, even long before we feel its full effects, we are guaranteeing certain outcomes that we are not going to like and people really need to know about it. Um, so that the urgency of what people were telling me, as I say, already 20 years ago, um, is what really got me. That's, that's, what, that's what caused one story to become three and to become sort of a two dec almost two decades now of, of coverage. You know, it's clear that humans as a species have altered the planet in a way that no other species has. But we're also more intelligent, more sentient than other, any other species that's existed. So I know you didn't, said you didn't <laughs> want to go down the road of hope, but I do wonder that uh, with all this um, intellectual power and now uh, a desire to, uh, particularly among younger generations, to, to change things and that we see the, the, the path that we're on, do you have any confidence, some confidence, that humans are capable of making a difference? Oh, yeah, I absolutely think humans are capable of making a difference. I think that one of the, you know, one of the lessons, though, unfortunately, of, of writing, there, there are 
many, many things we could do that if, and then, and even are doing that if we scaled them up to a big enough scale, and they weren't just, you know, some little pilot program somewhere, would, would make a huge difference. I was talking with, um, you know, folks today about, you know, marine reserves. We, we, we could put a, a, aside a lot more of the ocean, and that would probably make a big difference, and we could do the same on land. We could give species that are going to be on the move, right, because of climate change, everything is on the move, we could give them, you know, a path to move. There are people, for example, working on, you know, migration pa pathways between the states and Canada as, thing, as organisms, various animals move north. There are many, many things we could do that would make a, probably a quite significant difference to the future, you know, of evolution. Um, but one of the you know, lessons also, I think, of, the, of, of my own reporting, or at least for me, was that, you know, what, what is happening, hum, when humans change the world, uh, even sometimes when we think uh, we're not making a big difference, um, we are running up against evolution, which is a very slow process. So quick change uh, is just inimical to evolutionary uh, processes, and when you don't give organisms time to adapt to this changing world, uh, you get very high extinction rates. And I'm not sure uh, how we can, you know, just stop changing the world when there are so many of us who, you know, honestly would like to eat and obviously deserve to eat. And it's very difficult for those of us uh, here, sitting here in North America, uh, leading, you know, pretty comfortable lives to tell other people uh, what to do. So we run up against a lot of issues of social justice uh, and um, fairness that are also very, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. If species can't adapt uh, quickly enough to the pace of change that's happening now, um, are, are there any species that are showing signs that they can? Are there any, is there any evidence of any species that perhaps could I don't want to say benefit from climate change, but are finding a way to cope with it and perhaps even could thrive? Yeah, absolutely. There are lots of species that, um, that do really well with people. There are lots of species that do really well with disturbance. They, they tend to be species that, you know, we consider pests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, mosquitoes are doing really well, for example. Uh, you know, uh, one of the guys that I spent a lot of time with in, in, for, for my book uh, talks about rats. Rats have done really well, right? They now exist in many, many places that they didn't um, exist before because we've brought them there and they thrive. Uh, and they will diversify and speciate, right? And so we will get new species of rats. And, and he had written in a book, only half tongue-in-cheek, or maybe three-quarters tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, that one day there will be a species of intelligent rat uh, that will, you know, emerge from all this. So, you know, there are, yes, there are, and some unexpectedly, some organisms do unexpectedly well in urban environments, for example, uh, and some will adapt, absolutely. Um, the question is, you know, are those the species that we, we most dearly love? How's that? Or that would be, yeah, that would be, well, I guess if we're looking at it from a humor perspective, exactly. the species we want to have around us. Exactly. Right. Um, you know, you talked about in, in your early days of writing, uh, covering politics. Um, this is an intersection now of politics and, and science that we're at. Um, and, this, and this topic is climate change in America. So let me raise the idea of what's happening in America now and so many environmental regulations there have been rolled back. When you look at what is happening uh, to the EPA in the US, what do you think? Where does it leave you? Um, in in tears? No. <laughs> um, no, it's, 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 um, it's really, you know, very discouraging uh, to see the U.S. moving backwards pretty quickly, you know, or at least attempted. You know, once again, every, all this is going to get litigated. We're not going to go into sort of the details of environmental rollbacks in the U.S., but virtually every major piece of environmental every major environmental regulation and even some big pieces of environmental legislation uh, are being challenged right now and potentially uh, rolled back. And certainly we're not making any progress over the next two years. Um, so I think it's very, very destructive. It sets a terrible example, obviously, for the world. 
um, but it also has just genuinely very ser potentially very serious uh, ecological consequences. I think that we, you know, there's a long time lag in that system too, but I think we're going to see a lot of uh, destruction that we're going to regret, uh, but by that point, you know, once again, it will be too late. In the time that you've studied and spoken to so many scientists and, and compiled so much information, on this topic, what have you learned about human nature? <laughs> well, I think one of the things that I've learned about human nature, which I guess is good, is people are very, very, um, people are resilient and people are very optimistic. And there are a lot, a lot of people out there, uh, you know, very, uh, the, good, the good news, the one bit of good news I will give, there's a lot of, of very smart and committed people out there um, working to improve things. Now, you know, when you look at the sort of what is actually happening, you know, between the environmental rollbacks in the US and uh, growing global emissions, um, you know, you can't point to big macro trends that look terribly good right now. Um, but perhaps uh, we are laying a lot of good work that's going on, a lot of technological progress uh, is laying the groundwork uh, for something better. Uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, that is what uh, one has to hope for. Uh, anyone in this room who's you know, a young person or a parent of young people, uh, that's really what you, what you have to hope for. Well, certainly, I have a 14-year-old. There's lots of young people in this audience now. You have children. And not to be too maudlin, but you and I will be dead when the, the, the absolute worst is happening, if all the projections are accurate. So it's the people who, you're, who follow us who will be bearing most of the burden. So based on what you know and this, all the experts you've spoken to, what's, what's the message you deliver on that and, and to people who are, who are coming after us? Well, I, I think one important message to deliver is uh, actually to the people in the, in, you know, now there are younger people in positions of power now more and more, but I think to, uh, you know, people, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily name names, so I'd be happy to name names, but... Um, no, we'd like it if you okay. names. Okay, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to sit down. I, unfortunately, he, he's, he hasn't invited me to lunch with someone, you know, let's say like Mitch McConnell or Donald Trump and say, what, you know, what kind of a world do you think you are leaving to your kids and your grandchildren? Because all of these people would claim to be concerned about future generations. Um, so I think one of the big, you know, one of the reasons people have called climate change a super wicked problem, and one of the reasons it is a super wicked problem uh, is because of that generational um, disparity, that one generation is essentially fobbing the problem off on another. Now that was very much true, it's less and less true. We are now seeing more and more of the impacts, you know, in real time, but as I, uh, said before, you, you, you never feel the full impacts of what you've already put up there uh, for, you know, a, a few decades. So we're just, you know, catching up to what was up there, you know, uh, 10, 20 years ago. And the other part of climate change that's very alarming uh, is you can set in motion processes that simply cannot be reversed. And that was the message that climate scientists were giving me back, you know, in 2003, 2004, about the ice sheets, about melting Greenland, melting Antarctica, and that I'm sure people have read recent news accounts about you know, new, the latest scientific studies out of Antarctica, and they're very alarming. Uh, and that's what they were warning about, and that's what they continue to warn about, uh, and we ought to be listening. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked to um, a, a lot of people who are now saying that they, back to the topic of hope, I'm afraid, but that, <laughs> that people who really are, um, care about the topic deeply, want to connect something from the big picture to their personal lives, want to make some difference, want to find some way to live the kind of life that they think they should be living to sustain this planet, are having trouble knowing what that is. And to the point where people are depressed, where they feel like they don't have, uh, that it doesn't matter what they do, it's not going to make a difference. Is it really too late? Well, no, it absolutely isn't too late. I mean, that is, you know, the, the, that's the kind of, I mean, it's too late for the animals that are already extinct. It's too late to avoid 
you know, one degree Celsius of climate change because we already have that, okay? So certain things are too late. Have we crossed certain thresholds unwittingly uh, that are going to cause tremendous problems down the line? Possibly. Uh, but obviously every, you know, year that we wait to reduce emissions, we just guarantee a worse outcome uh, at, the, at the end. So this idea that there's some, you know, too late and not too late, I, I really, think that's crazy. I mean, the, the physics of climate change are such that, you know, the more CO2 you put up there, the greater the eventual temperature increase and the greater, you know, the damage. And so at any point, we have the opportunity to uh, fend that off. And I think that if we fall into this idea like, okay, well, it was okay yesterday, but t today it's too late, that's really dangerous. Let's open it up to you guys. Um, I think there's a microphone roving. Yeah, so um, if you've got questions, just put up your hand and, uh, and we'll come to you. Anybody questions? Sorry? Oh, perfect. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I have so many questions. It's hard <laughs> to know where to start. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's not so dissimilar here. I mean, yes, just yesterday, the, you know, the um, guy who's got a pretty good chance of being the next prime minister said scrapping the Canada's climate plan would be literally the first order of business um, if elected. And so my question to you, sort of as a journalist, someone in the space for so long, is like, why does the media have so much trouble tackling it as an urgent issue? I mean, you know, it's... Like if he, if he was going to scrap the, you know, heart disease program or some other yeah. like just obvious scientific fact and, um, you know, remedy, um, they treat it totally differently. That's, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I don't know this particular case. I, I was making a case to a class this afternoon that I think that the media is doing a, a better job. I mean, I think there's more coverage and it's more... Um, Alarming, how's that? Not alarmist, but alarming. It should be alarming. Um, you know, when the, uh, just the other day, when you know, 2018 was declared the you know, fourth year, warmest year on record, it, it did make the front page of the New York Times. Um, we did the story as well. A lot of Canadian outlets did. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the coverage is, is getting better and, and, and has, has more urgency. And I think we actually see reflected in public opinion polls, I think there's a, a, a relationship because when you know, people are talking about a problem, that problem rises in, in sort of salience. Um, now, why, the, but, but you know, the other part of it is climate change is, you know, it's an issue a little bit you know, like poverty. It will always be with us. There will be, poverty will be a problem tomorrow. It will be a problem the day after. It will always be a problem. Climate change is going to be a problem uh, for as long as anyone in this room is alive. And that kind of chronic problem uh, is very difficult for a media which depends on, you know, headlines and turnover and change uh, to deal with. And it's another unfortunate confluence of events, I worry, as a journalist, is that we have reached this you know, point in history of this incredibly complicated, difficult problem at a moment when actually journalism is also in crisis. You know, I don't want to go into yet another crisis. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> you know, sort of journalism that you know, costs money to go out and do reporting is also in crisis. And so a lot of what we see now on the web, you know, I don't have to tell you, is you know, you know, lists of the, you know, five best, I don't know what, yoga poses or whatever the hell it is. And, you know, that's not going to help solve this problem. So I think we have sort of overlapping crises uh, that is, that are also pretty worrisome. Next. Uh, yeah, there's a gentleman down here in the front. Just down here, right in the middle, in the fourth row. Thanks. Thank you for, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm going to just follow up on the, uh, the example you gave of speciation of rats. Uh, did you hear of other 
certain species that might take the place of all the species that are going to be gone? Well, I wouldn't, I mean, taking the place is kind of a, I'm not sure you'd, you'd put it that way, but if you, if you um, look at, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people are looking at it in a more rigorous way, but, you know, what are the species that do well in, in human-created environments, right? Crows actually do really well. So, you know, maybe, you know, the alala may be, not be with us, but a new species of crows may, um, may evolve from, you know, I have crows, you know, who live off the compost in my backyard. They're very, very smart and very adaptable. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll um, but I don't know that anyone has a very uh, clear handle on that, you know. Um, and the other, I guess the other point I'd make is, and, and this is, you know, sort of contradicted by the fact that we are actually seeing, you know, very, very potentially really alarming crashes in insect populations, but um, organisms that evolve very rapidly, right, that, that um, reproduce very rapidly, you'd think would, would have the best sort of evolutionary shot at a rapid environmental change. Um, but now we, you know, so I guess you could say it's extremely worrisome that we seem to even be challenging insects' ability to adapt. Next? Yep, there's a gentleman up there with a hat. Yep. Hi there. Hi there. Thanks for, thanks for coming to speak. I want to, I'm going to bring it back to hope once more. Um, I just wanted to, that, that sort of tendency to finish a piece of writing, a book, um, an academic paper or a talk with with a message of hope. I wanted to ask whether you might, um, whether you think it's at all dangerous. It's almost a requisite to do that. It's in the last line of every academic paper and it's in the five page chapter of every book that you read and I wondered if that is um, dangerous. Um, that's a, a question dear to my own heart. Um, I'm not sure I would say it's dangerous. I. I think it's kind of, as you say, reached a level of cliche at this point. You know, I hear are the reasons why the world is going to hell, but, you know, there's, um, and so I think it's almost, um, I, I read, uh, I think it was a, it was an, I don't know if it was an essay or an op-ed recently by a, a, a climate scientist um, named Kate Marvel, and you can find it online, I'm sure. Um, and her point was, you know, forget hope. We don't need hope. We need courage. And I thought that that was a very good point. The whole question of, of hope seems to me, um, you know, overrated. You know, did, did people ask themselves, you know, when they were, like, fighting the Nazis, you know, are we hopeful or not? It just doesn't seem really the relevant question. The relevant question is, you know, are we going to do something or not? And so I, I would like you know, to lay that aside. It, it is very discouraging. The things that need to be done to make a difference have to be done uh, at scale, and that's really hard, and there are a lot of forces arrayed against that, and, and, and you know, that includes ourselves and the way we live, and, and, and so there's, you know, sort of a lot, a lot of barriers to change. Um, but, you know, whether or not we're hopeful or not, just doesn't seem, I, as I say, it's, as you say, it's just become a tick, you know, at the end of everything. Oh, yeah, but let's, let's, let's be hopeful. But, but the real thing that should be, let's, let's get, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. So I love that idea of courage. Are you seeing, uh, is there anyone you see who's on the leading edge of that, who kind of can be a role model, who's doing the things that you think are courageous and necessary and uh, on, in the political sphere or the scientific world? Well, I mean, yeah, I think there are a lot of people who are out there, you know, um, who are either in the scientific community, you know, laying out what needs to be done, and, you know, people in the public policy world laying out what could be done, and even, you know, increasingly a few um, people, you know, laying out for, for the political world, trying to inspire people. Um, now we can, you know, we just had the Green New Deal. Uh, we were talking about that in, in, in class before. That's a com very complicated document, um, which I'm not going to sort of get, get into right now unless people really want to about, you know, whether that is, 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 is going to rally public opinion, whether it would do what it, you know, it's, it hasn't really been fleshed out, so we're not really sure what the details are. Um, 
but there is there are a lot of people trying to trying to rally uh, us to do what 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 we need to be doing. How's that? So there are I, I think that there's no no dearth of people if you if you are looking for inspiration out there. Anybody else? So I, I really loved the book when it first came out, and it reminded me of one of my favorite books, which is uh, Douglas Adams' Last Chance to See. So I was wondering, I just want to ask you if there were any influences, what, what you do influence or inspiration from when you wrote this book? Um, you know, I, I definitely took inspiration. Um, I have my own, you know, sort of literary heroes, I guess. Um, and you know, they include people like uh, Rachel Carson and John McPhee and Edward Abbey. I mean, a sort of classic pantheon of people who have written about the natural world in a way. Um, because writing about the natural world, writing about um, characters, as it were, who can't speak for themselves, you know, the Kanoes of the world, has its own set of challenges. So I really look to people who uh, had tackled that in, in, in different ways. Um, and so, you know, those are just a couple of, of, of David Quammen is one of my own um, favorite writers. So I, I, I definitely relied a lot on the Ed Wilson, on people who have, have, have written about uh, the natural world really, you know, brilliantly and movingly and inspiringly. Yeah, I saw another hand here. Yeah. Oh, oh. Sure, up there first. I have the microphone here, so can I just oh, ask sure. a question? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I couldn't see up there, absolutely. Okay. So I'm a family doctor, and I have major concerns about the effects of climate change on the health of my patients and the health of people, and one of the major issues that's coming up is eco-anxiety. And I'm wondering, as someone who sat in this knowledge and is an expert on this yourself, I'm wondering what strategies you've used to move past depression and anxiety, and based on that, what advice you would have for other people who are trying to do the same? Well, I certainly would not say I've moved past anxiety <laughs> or depression, so I don't think I'm really the person to be um, giving advice here. I can tell, all I can tell you is my husband has taken up meditation. He is very, that's his uh, way of, of, of coping. Um, I guess my, a way of um, dealing with things is 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 writing in its own way. You know, it's um, maybe not. A, uh, it's it's not. You know, everyone has to do, I guess, what they um, feel they can do. And I think one bit of advice. I'm really, really, really not in the advice biz. Um, but if I did have a piece of advice, I guess it would be, you know, everyone wants to be doing something. And there are very, many, many very useful things for people to be doing. So I think that once again, you know, don't, don't get anxious, get politically involved. How's that? That would be uh, my one piece of advice. All right. Who has a microphone? Is it? I do. Yeah. Go I ahead. Do. Hi. Um, uh, First of all, I want to say, just in answer to, just quickly, sorry, in answer to what you were saying about eco-anxiety, and there are things that people can do, like I'm involved in a group, Extinction Rebellion, and there's a huge amount of power in people just finding each other and talking about their fear and their sadness, and then kind of like when you feel it with other people and you feel like you're not the, like the Debbie Downer in the room going like, <laughs> oh, I'm really scared about climate change. But with your, when you're with a group of people being like, we are all scared of this, we're all scared of extinction. Now let's go and like find a target and go and do something. It's really empowering and it's really uplifting and there's a lot of power in community um, and just getting active together. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you was um, how likely is it that you see the extinction of this version of humanity, of this 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 version of us, will we go extinct soon? <laughs> um, this version of us being like this species sitting here in this room tonight. Um, the the capitalist version, the capitalist colonialist, take all the resources, consume it, sell it, discard it. This <laughs> version. Um, 
I don't have a good answer to that. You know, I mean, I think that um, the forces that, you know, a, a very, uh, a lot of people uh, who, who need to eat, who have very sophisticated weapons and very sophisticated technologies, and you put a lot of stresses um, on their, that, uh, you can imagine, you know, some, some pretty not pleasant outcomes. How's that? Um, but, you know, whether that means, um, you know, the, the sort of end of, 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 you know, modern society as we know it or not, I, I wow, I'm definitely not capable of, um, of predicting that. You know, I certainly think that, you know, as the Pentagon would say in the U.S., you know, climate change, um, in particular, is a really um, destabilizing, it's a very destabilizing uh, force in a world that's full of destabilizing forces. So I really don't know. Uh, I don't know where we're where we're headed. It it it, it seems like um, we're determined to put as much stress as possible on the system and see what happens. If you want to find out about Extinction Rebellion, come talk to me later. <laughs> <laughs> nice little plug there. Great. Uh, and who's next? Who has a, yeah? Um, I'm wondering what you think the role of media is in terms of education and especially in today's uh, world because it seems like there are experts in a lot of fields and it seems like all of these fields are now very connected and very connected to global warming. But to put together all of that information and understand it for ourselves and to know what we can do is very difficult. So somebody's avocado crop that is helping a community grow and you know become liberated from poverty might be detrimental to the climate and the species there, but I may not know that. Buying avocados thinking I'm doing <laughs> myself some good and, and, um, and that connected to um, uh, different social economics across the world like you were talking about. I can't find that information, I've tried. And most of where I'm getting that is through media and it's piecemeal and it's understandable that um, media can't always be experts. So what do you think the role of media is today and will that evolve to help people across the world understand better what their roles are? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, I come out of a really pretty you know, traditional media background. I, as I said, I work for the New York Times, I work for the New Yorker now, and, you know, in both cases, definitely the primary, you know, um, we, both institutions see their mission definitely as informing people. I'm not sure they would use the word educating, but certainly informing them, and education has a big, big part of that, and, you know, you know, the, the, explainer is a genre, you know, at the New York Times, and I wrote many of them in my day. Um, now, in terms of the information that you're looking for, I think that's a really interesting question, and, you know, we see such a proliferation now of media outlets, which on some level is, is wonderful, and maybe someone should start one where they, you know, look at uh, every you know everything in the grocery store and trace it back and you know where did that come from and and what are the impacts? It's a really interesting idea, um, but the one you know repository of all information you know besides I guess you know Wikipedia or whatever just just doesn't exist. I don't think it is going to exist. I think we are actually increasingly in a more fragmented me media environment. So I understand. I really understand the frustration of, you know, I can't find what I, what I want. Um, but, you know, the news media is definitely driven by, you know, by the news. And so that, that kind of, um, you know, off the news question that you're asking, not, not quite on the news, but really interesting and important, it, it only gets done, that sort of thing gets done by probably a lot of NGOs. I mean, there are probably a lot of, there probably is a lot of information about, you know, where your food is coming from, but it, it's probably pretty piecemeal. Yeah, where's the microphone now? Uh, yes, yeah, so the young woman up here. Oh, sorry, I'll come to you next. In doing research for this book, what surprised you the most? Um, 
Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess I, I guess doing the research on ocean acidification was really eye-opening to me. It was not a topic that I'd heard much about. It's actually still not a topic that you hear that much about. Um, but if you talk to scientists about sort of the long trajectory of life on Earth, they will say, you know, it, it, the instances, it's, it's quite possible that what, what we're doing now, changing the chemistry of the oceans, it's, it's possible that they've never changed more dramatically than they've changed right now. It's very, actually very difficult to change the, um, or, or, or faster than they've changed right now. It's really quite hard to change the chemistry of the oceans. So I think that ocean acidification was for me a big sort of eye-opening, you know, oh my God, kind of, uh, uh, not a discovery, I certainly didn't discover, but, but, but to you know, learn more about that. All right, there's someone over here. Yeah, uh, Yeah. so I was wondering uh, that climate change is such a global problem that the, it affects everyone from the eastern to the western to the northern to the southern hemisphere, right? And how do we, how do we tackle such kind of a problem with entities such as nations which have their own laws? Uh, some nations, they, don't, they refuse to accept things like climate change, like Brazil and matter of fact, the United States, <laughs> whereas some other continent like Asia and Europe have been investing uh, to, in a large scale in re renewable energy, right? So how do we tackle a global problem in terms of national uh, entities? Wow, you've asked, like, you know, the question of our time. Um, and, you know, every, every year when there's a new you know, conference of the parties to the framework convention on climate change, you know, everyone sits there and asks themselves that same question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, that, that this, there's a constellation of issues. Um, you know, I was, I was using that phrase, and it's not mine, once again, uh, that, you know, that, that climate change is a super wicked problem. So one of, one of the problems is the intergenerational component. The other is the, uh, international component that people um, who contributed the most to the problem will not necessarily, in fact, quite probably will not, be probably an inverse relationship between how much you contributed to the problem and how much you suffer from the effects. Uh, and another problem is it is a truly global problem. It can only be say, solved on a global level. Uh, and we do not have a very good record uh, of solving global problems. Now, the one global problem that we did or I shouldn't say the one, but one that we did tackle, uh, which was supposed to be the template for dealing with climate change, uh, was the ozone hole, ozone depleting chemicals. Um, so we discovered that uh, in the 80s, ozone depleting chemicals, uh, ozone protects the earth from ultraviolet radiation, super important, you know, hard to be more important, uh, and you know, there was the usual you know, pushback from the people who made ozone depleting chemicals, but the world did come together, uh, including the U.S., uh, and signed a treaty under Ronald Reagan phasing out ozone depleting chemicals. And the, um, you know, template for that was, okay, developed countries go first and developing countries come later. Now, it is an imperfect treaty, and we are now seeing uh, some of the complicated effects of it, and we still have an ozone hole, but it was basically a pretty good deal. We did pretty well with that. Uh, and a lot of people thought, were hopeful at that moment, that that was the international regulatory framework that was, we were gonna use that same kind of thinking, developed countries go first, developing countries go next, to solve uh, climate change or to deal with climate change, and it just simply has not happened. Now, why is that? There are probably you know, people in this room who could address that question, policy experts more uh, expertly than I could. Uh, but one of the problems is uh, that you know, there's a huge infrastructure around fossil fuels and the world, uh, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of power, uh, and we all use a lot, we use a lot, tremendous amount of energy uh, these days. So you know, it just has proved very, very difficult uh, for us to make that move forward. In fact, uh, we have only moved backwards. Really, on a macro level, we have only moved backwards. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there, did you ask one already? No. Oh, you didn't, I'm sorry, <laughs> forgive me, go ahead. Um, I just want to come back to your uh, writing uh, practice, and I'm curious about a couple of things. One is, do you have a writing ritual? And how do you actually approach writing your books? Do you sort of write a bunch of different articles and see which one of them matures into a book, or do you have an idea of a book first and then your articles follow a particular pattern? And what's your next book? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, my writing practice involves, um, yeah, getting up, wasting a certain amount of time, reading <laughs> the newspaper, Twitter, the usual, uh, and then sitting down at my desk and trying to write and trying not to get distracted by, you know, the world and social media and the 30 million things that you could be doing instead of writing. Okay, so that's that. <laughs> not terribly interesting. Um, and the way, I've only really written two books, so it's not like there's some grand scheme here. One was basically a series of articles that became a book, and one I sort of had the idea for the book and then wrote the articles, so two different ways. And the last question, I am trying to write another book. It's going really slowly, and the sort of um, basic synopsis of it, it's very inadequate that I can give, is um, living on a, on a, on a man-made planet. On a well, please keep writing it. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to set aside the distractions. We look forward to reading it and are so thankful for your insight, your passion, and your courage, which was a great description, courage over hope. I think we can all applaud that. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for um, your insight and coming and speaking to us tonight. Also, I want to thank the school, uh, UBC, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, and of course, the wonderful Phil Lind, whose generosity and intellectual curiosity is what makes this entire series possible. So, thank you. Thank you.